uh, how to control the process that you're using. Um, and in order to do so, uh, we need to do a couple of things ahead of time. We need to understand the process that we have. And that doesn't just mean physical thicknesses and the layers that we're um, depositing. Um, and it doesn't just mean the materials we're using. What we need to make sure that we do is we have uh, our coating machines characterized. Even if we're using the same coating uh, materials in different coating machines, they may be slightly different uh, in their characterization, their index and their tooling factors, obviously. So <clears throat> it's one of the things that I recommend uh, is that when we start out, when we first start doing characterizations, uh, that we do it once every season, spring, summer, fall, and winter. Um, a lot of companies, a lot of people, uh, they spend a lot of money on um, getting uh, proper environmental controls. So we want to stabilize the temperature and stabilize the humidity. But we all know that at some point, um, in the, especially in the summer when it gets really hot and muggy out and humid out, uh, that sometimes the, uh, the money that we spent on those environmental controls just can't handle the heat and the humidity. And that affects uh, the environment in the lab. So it's a good idea to really know what, uh, at first, to know what your uh, lab environment is like by producing um, some coatings and measuring them and comparing them uh, throughout the seasons. Once you have that information down um, and uh, filed away, then you can go ahead and maybe do that once a year. Personally, I recommend that uh, characterization of each machine is done at least once a year and maybe twice a year. And that characterization just makes sure that um, when you're running your processes, even though they probably come out okay and they're in spec, maybe they're a little bit off, that your machine is running well and that the process that you've put in place is still on track. Um, unfortunately, uh, the worst thing that can happen is if your process goes off track and you don't know how to get it back. Um, and by not having that information available and not having that, uh, that uh, backup information to go back to the process that you want to start with, uh, that you did start with and that you want to run, um, that can cause a lot of trouble and a lot of grief. And uh, unfortunately, you don't know where to look. Uh, those are unknowns. And so, um, like I say, that's what I recommend. Uh, maybe once a year at least, definitely once a year at least, maybe twice a year, uh, do the characterization so you have that data going forward. Once you have that data going forward, um, then it's easy to go back to uh, the process you started with. Uh, some people buy processes, some people make processes in-house, and uh, to have that process that you've purchased or even that you've made in-house after several years, um, the process that you're actually running for production may not be the process that you started out with and that you spent a lot of time um, uh, researching and developing in order to have a good product to sell to your customers. So it's always a good idea to make sure that that process is always the same and go back to that and have that data on hand in a file somewhere. Um, today we're going to be looking at uh, using the Hunter Lab Pro, uh, which is uh, starting to be used widely in ophthalmic labs. And um, personally, personally, I like them. I like the, the Hunter Lab Pro, um, and I like the products from Hunter Lab. And this is not a commercial for Hunter Lab. Uh, there's a lot of good spectrophotometer country companies out there making good products. Um, but the one thing that I like about the Hunter Lab Pro is, or Hunter Lab products, is that they're aware that their products are being used in an uh, optical thin films lab, and especially um, the ophthalmics lab coating eyeglasses. And I'm just going to show you real quick their website. And you can see I have here, um, they've got a good document here showing how to measure and scan lenses uh, in their product. And so if you're measuring actual lenses that's, uh, themselves rather than just samples, they go through there very quickly and very nicely. Can everybody see that on my screen there? I'm at their website.
Yes, okay. And so if you scroll down, um, you know, it gives you a lot of information. It's a, it's a document uh, showing you how to do these things. Um, and they're, they're quite good with their, uh, with their customer support if you have any questions beyond what's in this document. Um, they also, this, in this particular document, they show how to use the inside um, of the, sorry, let me get this correct. They show inside the spectrophotometer how to measure inside. And in this document, they show how to measure um, glass outside using the light trap. Again, I apologize, this is not a, uh, a commercial or an ad for Hunter Lab, but it's a, it's a good piece of equipment and it's quite versatile for uh, doing everything you need to do in the coding lab uh, when it comes to ophthalmics. Okay, so the first thing we want to do is um, characterize our coding machines, find the tooling factors of the materials we're using, and uh, get the refractive indices for those. And one of the reasons it's really important to get the refractive indices for those, I'm going to show a quick example of that. And here I have an ophthalmic green AR. And this is a, a standard AR coating that's used in the ophthalmic industry that is, uh, has the green color to it. And this one here, I can show you what the design is. 21.88 nanometers low, 9.62 nanometers high, and so on. You can see that here. And the H and L correspond to SiO2 and TiO2L1 in this case. And I've named this just as an example as TiO2L1 uh, because this uh, TiO2 index file relates to a machine that I have called L1, for example. Okay? If I were to change that TiO2L2, which is a slightly different index profile, and I'll show you that in a minute, I'm going to say OK to that, calculate it. And we can see that it's quite different. And that might be a color shift that is not acceptable for the lab for quality assurance, quality control, or maybe even your, your uh, customers. And so it's important really to have um, the index data for each material for each coding machine in a file somewhere so that when you're looking at your designs, looking at your processes, and trying to keep those processes on track, um, it's important to know all about those processes, including these things. Okay, when it comes to Filmstar, um, I've showed you uh, the index files for TiO2L1 and TiO2L2, and using Filmstar, they have an index program. And here's the Filmstar index program where I can ent that, enter that data once I find it. Once I do the test runs and run a single layer of SiO2 on a sample, a single layer of TiO2 on a sample, uh, maybe you're using Drelo, maybe you're using hafnium oxide, you'll be able to take the index data and put it in here. And I've done that with the TiO2, L1, and L2. And here it shows... Uh, index, and then it shows absorption. In this case, there's no absorption in the TiO2L1. What I want to show you here is at 550, the TiO2 index, L1 index, at 550 down here is 2.27. Can you, everybody see that down at the bottom there? And if I open this up and show TiO2L2, 
at 550, it's 2.18. And this, these two uh, examples I've made, the 2.27 for TiO2L2, or sorry, L1, is an example of uh, TiO2 used uh, with an ion gun or ion assisted deposition. The TiO2L2 sample um, shows that maybe it's uh, with a smaller ion gun or no ion gun at all, um, and it has a lower refractive index. And so by looking at these two examples of TiO2 and just those small differences in, in refractive index, that's where we can see using the same physical thicknesses, the same process uh, in those different machines, that that's the difference that we're actually seeing. If we make our design uh, for L1, machine L1, using the refractive index of TiO2 from that, we can go ahead and take the refractive index and the process parameters for machine L2 and implement it and make our design, make our processes so that they actually match each other. And so that both machines are making the exact same product, although the process might be slightly different. And they would have to be slightly different based on the characterizations of those two different machines. Okay? Any questions about uh, the index data and the characterizations about those uh, about different machines? Okay. Okay, I'm going to move on. Um, so now that we have our process set and uh, hopefully we have our machine or machines characterized, we know the tooling factors, we know the uh, index data that we're going to use and we have that set, we can go ahead with the process that we want to run. Everything is going well. We have uh, products coming out that are good, but we all know that every once in a while, um, for various reasons, a process will go off track and it will give us a slightly different color and a slightly different result. And the first thing we want to do is get that back on track so that we have nice consistent product, nice consistent colors that uh, we are happy with and our customers are going to be happy with. What level of K do you consider absorption? Um, I'm just going to uh, stop for a moment. Will has asked a question here. Um, that depends on the product, Will. Uh, for this example that I'm doing today, uh, I'll compare it to another example in a second. For this example that I'm doing today, which is uh, for ophthalmic AR coatings for eyeglasses, in this case, the detector is our eye, our retina. And uh, in some case, in some ways, the eye is a good detector it helps us see and walk around and do the things that we do as people. And in some cases, it's a bad detector. It's not very sensitive to things like absorption. If we're making products uh, for uh, laser applications, um, a level of K uh, is going to depend on the power of the laser, depend on the detector, and depend on what the application that system is going to go out and run and the, the processes it's going to run and the things that it's going to measure. Um, so, unfortunately, there's a lot of answers to the question that you just asked. Uh, it's going to be very specific and very dependent on uh, the end product and the end application. Um, ideally, we would like no K, no absorption at all in our thin films, um, but that's very, very difficult uh, to get. Um, there's ways around that. There's uh, post-processing we can do, uh, depending on application. But in the actual coating machine, um, there's always going to be just that little tiny bit of absorption that we're unable to get rid of. Um, but for most, most uh, applications, it's going to be OK. OK, uh, I'm going to move on. So we've got a process that we've set. We have our machines characterized. We know uh, the tooling factors and indexes of those machines. And uh, we're running processes. We're moving along nicely, and uh, all of a sudden we have a process that kind of uh, comes out that is out of spec or the color isn't quite good enough. And I'm just going to move this. I'm going to put our design back to our good sample.
and that's what we want to start with. That's the process that we've set up or, or the process that we've purchased from a, a vendor. Excuse me. And so if we're using our Hunter Lab, and in this uh, webinar I'm using the Hunter Lab as an example, we'll open up our Hunter Lab software. And I have several samples set up as examples for this. I'm going to open the job. Ophthalmic webinar. And we can see here, um, I have all these samples, sample one, sample two, and then these uh, examples from the different machines with their different run numbers set up. Here in this pane here, we can see that we have our scans. Um, in the background, we can see the, the visible spectrum that's showing uh, the reflectivity across the entire spectrum. And then over here we have our LAB uh, data. I'm just going to make sure that those pop up. We can see the different LAB and we can see they're kind of grouped fairly nicely around here and we have a couple of wayward um, LAB that maybe uh, uh, we wouldn't be able to sell to our customers. We have to reprocess those, strip them, or uh, start all over again. So you can see here I've got, uh, let's see, L1679, L1680, and so on. This data is saved in a database that comes with um, uh, the EasyMatch QC uh, software for the Hunter Lab. And working with uh, FTG software, the makers of Filmstar, um, we've been able to extract that data and bring it up into a, um, into a file, I'm just bear with me for a moment, I've got to move stuff around so I can access things, into a file in WinFilm called Spectra. And this is just what we've done. And there is my Hunter Lab data for this example. Okay? If I open that up, If I open that up, it should be there. Just bear with me for a moment. I'm going to close that. So what I've done is if I, I've extracted the data and that comes out in a CSV file from here out of the database that the Hunter Lab stores this in. And so in here we can see sample one, sample two, and so on. These are the examples I made for this webinar. This data here, the first three are our LAB data. And then along here, um, it's just the single um, reflectivity at a specific wavelength. And this data is what we use to import into Filmstar to give us our spectrum that we're going to analyze in Filmstar and correct for. Okay. So using this data that we've got in our Excel file, I'm going to go ahead and open that up. And the way that I do that, one of the features of Filmstar is these little modules that we can open up, one, two, three, four, five, and 6. These are basic files that were made um, by myself and uh, FT FTG software. Going into Tools and Macro Commands, we can see here that I've set number five and number six. Number five is import Hunter Lab Spectra. And this is where the file sits. That's where I opened it up from. And we can see that in Excel. And number six is fix AR Hunter Lab data. And this is uh, a basic file that was written so that it takes the spectra that we imported from the Hunter Lab and uses that to correct for um, to get back into the process that we want to run, a good process. Okay? So I'm going to go ahead and run number five. I want to import that Hunter Lab Spectra. And for this webinar, this example, I'm just going to use L1679. 
that's a run that I ran. It's I can tell by looking at it the color is slightly off and I don't like it, but I want to see what the problem is and maybe bring that um, process back into spec. Okay. Obviously, the first thing we want to do when we have a bad run is look for anything obvious. Maybe the setup was wrong. Maybe uh, something was wrong with the coding machine. Uh, we don't want to fix a run, a bad run, if we know what the problem was and it was just set up, if it was operator error, uh, a bad crystal, whatever the case may be. So we want to run that again. Maybe if you feel the need, we'll run a test run just to make sure that uh, it wasn't the machine problem, it wasn't a bad process. Um, but what I have here is L1679, a bad run, and it looks like I want to fix that. Okay, so I'm importing that data, L1679, and I'm going to redraw that. And there's 679 from my Hunter Lab, which is right here. You can see that there. And I'm going to copy this spectrum. Now this data that I have written here or showing, this graph here that I have showing in Filmstar, is just data points. It's not a, uh, an actual a design file that I can recalculate or, or um, uh, fix inside of Filmstar. So I have to take the spectra right up top here and copy that data. And then I want to be able to use that data and I go into Evaluate, go into the Interactor function. And that brings up this window here, this function in Filmstar, where I can interact with the actual design itself, with the parameters of the design and the process that I've, I've made myself. One thing I want you to see at the bottom in the right-hand corner is this design here will give us a color output. And right down here in the right-hand corner, we can see what that color is. It's really, really dark, actually. Um, and what I need to do is make that look more real. And I go into Evaluate, RGB Reflection Boost. I'm going to call that 100. I want to make it as bright as we can for this, for this particular webinar. And we can see it's brightened right up. It's still the same color value, still the same LAB or RGB color. Um, but it's just brightened it up and it looks more real from what we, uh, to what we actually see in the lab. Okay, so this is our design. And I've copied the spectra um, from the sample uh, that I've taken out of Hunter Lab. And so I want to paste that data into here. And so now it shows the overlay of our design, the process that we want to run and the sample that I want to correct for. And you can see down in the right-hand corner, it's added. Now it has both colors that we can compare. And we can see that difference. We can actually go into Evaluate and do our RGB, our red, green, blue comparator. And a little window pops up and shows those two different colors. It's a nice way of actually seeing a good comparison of those two colors. Okay. The one in the middle is our green color, and the one on the outside is the second one, our pasted data. And you can really see that, actually. This one in the middle is more green, which corresponds to the, the uh, spectrum that we're seeing uh, from our design. And this the pasted data from our sample is showing a lot more blue. And you can see it's actually a lot more blue around there. Okay, So now we can compare those two. We can look at the uh, two different colors. We can determine whether um, this is a design that, or a, a process that maybe we can pass or not pass. Maybe we're okay with that and we can continue using it. And we can also actually measure different lenses. We all know that uh, when coating eyeglasses, some lenses, most uh, lenses that are dipped CR39, they all come out the same color. But when we have polycarbonate that are spin coated, when we have high index um, uh, lenses, 1.74 plastic, and we dip that, <coughs> excuse me, when we dip that and then air coat it, 
it's a little bit brighter of a color. It's a different color. And we can go in here and actually measure using the Hunter Lab a CR39 lens that has gone through the process and a 1.74 or a polycarbonate lens that has gone through the process. And we can actually see those two different colors and adjust for it if we want to. Okay? So this is how we use Interactor, uh, how we can compare colors and how we put that data in from the Hunter Lab. So I'm going to go back out, and I do want to correct for this design, uh, this sample that I've, I've uh, measured using Hunter Lab, and I've decided I do want to correct for that. Okay, so I'm going to move back out and go back into our regular window for Filmstar. Oops, sorry about that. I'm going to uncorrect, uh, uncheck Interactor. So that brings us back into our regular window. If I calculate, that's the process that we want to see. That's the good, uh, the good design that we're using. And so I'm going to go into number six here, which is our fixed AR Hunter Lab data. I'm going to click that. And that brings up this little window here that allows me to select from that file the different samples that I've extracted out of or imported, uh, uh, exported out of uh, the Hunter Lab. So I'm going to go ahead and use L1679 again and click OK. And now you can see, let me get that back. So you can see a couple of things here. It shows the design, the one that we bought or purchased or, or I'm sorry, uh, set up ourselves. The measured, which is our sample data. And it's gone through a... Um, an optimized function where it checks the layer thicknesses against the design layer thicknesses and adjusted for them to bring that uh, measured data down into the color or the design curve that we actually want to have here. And the first thing it does is pops up this little box here. If calculated and measured curves overlap, click OK. And the reason that box is there is we can see that our blue measured curve and our calculated green curve do overlap. If they don't overlap, the, the measured data is too far away from the design for Filmstar to actually calculate and give you the product. And it's actually not Filmstar's fault. It could be that your uh, process is so far off that we really need to go back and look at that process look at the machine, make sure that all of our uh, data, all of our index and tooling factors, uh, the setup by the technicians uh, is all correct and start from scratch again. In this case, and really in most cases, what happens is that we're just a little bit uh, off of our um, design or our process. And as we can see here, it does match the two measured and calculated. And so I'm going to click OK. And what pops up here is layer 1, layer 2, layer 3, layer 4, and layer 5. And what we can do in order to adjust for those layer thicknesses in the machine that we just ran this process in and bring that process back into a good color, a good product. Okay? I can copy this from the clip to the clipboard and I can open up Microsoft Excel, or sorry, Microsoft Word in this uh, example. You can use uh, anything that you're using, any text editor. And I'm going to paste that there. I can call this today's date uh, with the run number and correction factors. And this is on file somewhere. This is um, a good uh, file to have showing that I've changed this process, this date, for this reason. Okay? So getting back to this, I'm done with this now. I have the, uh, the layer thickness changes I need to use. I'm going to close this. And we can see in our graph here, it has the design, the measured, the calculated, and now it shows that by making those changes to the layer thicknesses in the machine that we're using, the corrected, the, the pink color here, actually goes straight right over our design nicely, and it should match up very nicely when we run that process again. Okay, so I'm going to close this. 
And we can see in the background here all these green dots and these green lines. And this is a function of Filmstar showing how it took the sample that we had imported from the Hunter Lab and it went through a whole bunch of calculations in order to um, get us back into the design that we wanted. Okay. Okay, any questions about what we just talked about there or what, uh, what you guys just saw there? I see we have a few new visitors or new attendees, um, Aaron and Maria and Mohammed. Uh, just let me know if, um, if you're having any trouble. If you have any other questions. Okay. Um, well, I hope everybody got something out of this, and uh, it really shows, um, you know, what we can actually do in the lab and uh, make things a lot easier sometimes. I know, uh, sure, Mohammed, go ahead. Mohammed has a question. You'll have to type it out, and I can answer it for everybody. But it really shows how uh, it can really help in the lab. Sometimes having a process go off course, and uh, if we really don't know the parameters of our machine, the uh, tooling factors and the index data and um, the original design, the original process, uh, that we had, maybe we purchased it a couple of years ago, maybe uh, we're using it in a new coding machine. Um, this really helps a lot, uh, getting things back on track and keeping things on track. Okay, Mohammed has a question. I'm going to look at that. What about the thickness of the layers? Okay, so um, if I understand the question you're asking, Right here, <clears throat> excuse me, right here, uh, I know you came in later, Mohammed. Um, right here we have layer one, layer two, layer three, and these are how we have to, uh, the percentage rates, uh, what we have to apply to the layer thicknesses that we have in our design, which I'll bring up right here. And our design, in groups editor here, we have 21.88 nanometers of SiO2 and 9.62 nanometers of TiO2. This is our design right here. This is a regular five-layer design using SiO2 and TiO2. And we can take those correction factors right here, layer one, we don't have to change at all. Layer two, we have to increase by 14%. Layer three, we have to multiply by, by 0.829. In the, in the machine that we ran this, uh, coding in if we want to correct for that color. Does that answer your question, Mohammed? Okay, good. Okay, um, are there any more questions? I'll give a couple of seconds for people to ask if they have any more questions. I hope you guys got something out of this. Um, I hope it was informative. Um, and I know sometimes, especially in the ophthalmic industry, how tough it can be to keep your processes on track. It's a, a very high volume, very quick uh, environment to be in. Uh, I just want to make sure that you uh, know that if you do have a process that goes off track, a color that isn't quite right, um, not to go ahead and use this uh, method um, to correct for it because it may have been a one-time thing. It may be also that, um, you know, through the seasons, if you have a process set up in the winter where it's dry and cold out, uh, in the summer, we want to see that if this is a regular thing, if your colors are coming out uh, more and more whitish or bluish, that then we would correct for that. We don't want to correct for a process that just happened once. We want to make sure that it's, uh, it's not just a one-time thing. Okay, well I don't see any more questions there. 
Uh, thank you all for uh, coming and uh, taking part. And like I say, I hope you got anything out. Of, you got something out of this. If you have any further questions or questions that might come up afterwards, uh, feel, feel free to email me at DaveTadio at CodersTech.com. William Smith, do you have know a way of stripping non-conforming lenses without polishing? Um, again, William, you've asked another question that has a uh, a lot of answers. It depends on the material, the coating material, and the lens material. Um, the lens material, if you're coating glass, if it's BK7, if it's uh, SF6, or something like that. You want to make sure that whatever you're dipping your lens into strip um, isn't going to actually attack and ruin your glass, uh, which you may already know. Um, SiO2, TiO2, uh, hafnium oxide, aluminum oxide, they're all um, soluble in different acids or bases. Uh, some people use um, sodium hydroxide to strip SiO2 and TiO2. Uh, some people may have to use sodium hydroxide at a high temperature, maybe 80 or 100 degrees Celsius. Um, unfortunately, uh, that's a question that uh, has an answer that is, uh, it depends. It depends on the substrate. It depends on the coating material. Uh, don't quote me on this, but if you're using SiO2 and TiO2, you may be able to use sodium hydroxide. If you're using SiO2 and T uh, hafnium oxide, you may not be able to use uh, sodium hydroxide. You may have to use something else in order to strip those lenses. Um, maybe go to LinkedIn and ask that question. Uh, sometimes the response to questions like that are really, really good. Uh, sometimes they may sit for a couple of weeks and you may not get any answer at all. So try LinkedIn and ask some of those questions. Uh, hopefully you find a good answer there. Mohammed, Mohammed asks, is DLC layers are used in ophthalmic applications? DLC being uh, diamond-like carbon, not that I'm aware of. Diamond-like carbon uh, typically isn't transparent in the visible region, so as you apply diamond-like carbon to eyeglasses, it's going to become dark and you're not going to be able to see through it. I was reading an article uh, a couple of weeks ago that Somebody was producing transparent DLC coatings. I don't know much about that, but the standard DLC coatings that are out there today um, cannot be used in ophthalmics because they're, um, they're absorbing, they're non-transparent. The thicker they go, even very thin DLC coatings are going to block too much light and it's going to become dark and uh, you're not going to be able to see through them very well. DLC is also depending on the coating parameters, um, very stressful uh, and may actually peel off the lenses depending on the substrate, whether it's plastic or glass, um, whether you're inter, uh, having it um, in the middle of other layers, uh, it may not work very well. As far as I know, DLC is not used in ophthalmic applications because you, you just can't use it. It's, no, it's uh, not transparent. Okay. If you have any other questions, please email me. Um, maybe I can help you out uh, with stuff that uh, comes up later on as you're thinking about this. And thank you for, uh, for coming. Oh, Mohammed, because they are AR and wear resistant. The DLC, um, diamond-like carbon as I know it, which is typically used in um, infrared applications for um, protecting uh, protecting outward facing lenses. Um, DLC in ophthalmic applications um, because of what I was just saying won't work. Now they're wear resistant. They're wear resistant because Diamond-like carbon is very, very hard, and it's used a lot in tools. It's used a lot, uh, like in cutting tools for steel and machine shops. It's used a lot in transmission 
uh, parts, gears for transmissions, and things like that. AR um, applications for diamond light carbon are only in um, uh, infrared applications. The refractive index of DLC is somewhere around 2.1, 2.2, and the refractive index of DLC on substrates that have a refractive index that is much higher than DLC, like silicon, which is 3.4, and, and uh, germanium, which is around 4, that's when DLC acts like an AR coating. If you put DLC, which is, has a refractive index of 2.2, or around, you know, maybe 2.1 or so, depending on how you deposit it. If you put that on a material like plastic, which has a refractive index, or CR39, which has a refractive index of uh, 1.5 or so, first of all, it will be absorbing, so you won't be able to see through it. If it's not absorbing, then it's actually going to increase the reflection. It has a much higher refractive index than the actual plastic, and so the refractive index or the reflection is going to go up significantly, uh, probably above maybe 25 or closer to 30 percent uh, reflection. Uh, so unfortunately, DLC is not very good at all uh, for uh, anti-reflection coatings or for wear resistant in eyeglasses. Ah, you're welcome. Okay, thank you again for showing up and uh, and being here. Again, if you have emails or questions, uh, feel, feel free to email me, and I'll do whatever I can to help out. Thank you. I'm going to close this down now. Oh, there's another question that seems to have popped up here. Ah, well, just thank yous and goodbyes. Thank you.